The story I want to talk about today is a classic one. It's one of those stories I read when I was around 14 and just getting into creepypasta. Around that time, I was watching narrations of many of the oldest and most famous stories from Mr. Creepypasta. He actually narrates this story in January of 2014. I don't remember if I first heard it from his narration or someone else's around the same time. Regardless, I remember it being one of the first stories I had found where I was genuinely engaged with the writing and the lesson it told. Here we have a story which deals with dirty emotions and selfishness. It has several characters which are interwoven to create a beautiful and believable world. The story itself is gripping and a bit chilling at times. It does not aim to be particularly scary, but it does manage to be unsettling. Given that this is such an early story, many of the elements in it feel fresh and original. I aim to take a close look at it and explain what exactly it is that makes the cell phone game stand above countless other forgettable or cliché stories from its time. There will be a link to the original story in the description, as well as the Mr. Creepypasta narration, which is worth a listen if you haven't heard it. The cell phone game actually has a few parallels to Baraska in its setup. It features the narrator, who goes by Jack, move to a new town and become exposed to a small, tight-knit group of high school students. The students are each introduced, and we are slowly fed information about the cell phone game itself, leading for us to read on and wonder. The narrator also feels human, as he is in high school, and he deeply celebrates getting his first girlfriend. Immediately following that sense of joy, we are filled with a sense of dread, as Stephanie explains the rules of the cell phone game. This tells us that she has at the very least considered playing the game, and of course that some sort of danger is involved. Interestingly, the game rules also explain in detail that there are two ways to extend your life after entering the game. The first is to find a protective item, and the second is to send a chain text inviting someone else to the game. The first element is particularly mystifying. It even feels a bit ominous, as it causes the holder some sort of suffering, but it is a permanent solution. Of course, Stephanie ends up entering the game, and the rest of the story deals with her frantic survival. We see this through the narrator, who is her boyfriend. This works really well, as we are kept wondering about her actions. It is clear that she's deceptive, and she ends up killing several of the girls by inviting her them to the game. We as the reader now are undoubtedly certain that the game is real and has great risk. Rottenbacher, a character who up to this point has only been addressed as a weird outcast neo-Nazi, curses out Stephanie when she tries to bring him into the game, exclaiming that he is already in the game. This is, to me, the point where the story really takes off. Jack's next paragraph is key. He says, Bullshit, I said. If all that's true, how are you still... Suddenly I remembered the Solis. Rottenbacher had wore around his leg that caused him to limp in agony, and what Stephanie had told me at lunch. Whenever a new protective item was discovered, whatever it was, it would cause its bearer to suffer. This thought process indicates a fault of many people. They associate the physical and visible things of the world much higher than the mental ones. This would be especially true in Rottenbacher's case, as he's an outcast, and therefore no one really knew him. Jack guesses that the harm he inflicts on his leg is the way that he initiates protection. We as the reader now really feel Stephanie and Jack's tumultuous love and fear as they try to find a solution to the fast approaching deadline. We see Stephanie lie to Jack, making him think everything is okay, when in reality she killed a huge number of classmates by inviting them into the game just to buy herself a bit more time. This is human nature. You will do whatever it takes to survive, even if it is completely irrational. That push for survival is why the story is so alive and so real. The resolution of the story has Stephanie storming into Rottenbacher's apartment and holding him at gunpoint to take his solace. The story closes with a dramatic call from Stephanie to Jack as she is being taken by a mysterious creature. She is killed and at that point the story all falls together. The last paragraph reads, But there is one thing that I do know, and that is to this very day, if you ever see Rottenbacher, he's still always wearing that red Nazi swastika armband. We as the readers finally piece everything together. The mention of the school being Catholic in the beginning shows us that Jason, 
who in all instances except the first is given the rude nickname of Rottenbacher, was a deeply religious individual. The suffering he had withstood was to exile himself and, he, and outwardly convey a tough guy neo-Nazi persona. The only indication this was false was his limp. Stephanie and Jack failed to realize that this mental suffering was the true suffering. Jason had truly saved everyone. That is why he lost it when he realized that Stephanie was the culprit for all the other dead classmates. He had done everything in his power to prevent that, and she had gone and fucked it all up. It must have felt devastating. He was the definition of an unsung hero and is absolutely the most creative character in this story. The twists at the end make the reader think long and hard about the way that people view others. They often only have a small, shallow interpretation of someone. The story shows us that this is not okay. Every single person is a complex entity and deserves to be given some respect. The fact that all of this was accomplished by using a supernatural game type of creepypasta is even more unbelievable. Often these games or ritual type creepypastas just try to creep out the reader with a series of complex and strange rules and eventual involvement of a demon or ghost. While this story does feature briefly a physical demon, it aims to show us that the most vicious demons are sometimes the same people that you call friends. Stephanie put herself before everything else, and she paid the price for that. The cell phone game masterfully executes this lesson.